Uh, my name is Jay Weigel. I am a composer living here in New Orleans, working on films and different media projects, and we're currently sitting in Loyola University where I teach a class. You know, I grew up here in New Orleans, and I grew up uh, back in the day when every school had a band, so I started out as a drummer at St. Catherine of Siena School, and then ultimately it's changed schools, no band, started to play bass because I could put a band together, and we, so I played rock and jazz all the way through uh, uh, high school and into college, but uh, and when I was about 16, I heard for the first time Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring, and it just absolutely blew my mind. This would be about 1975 or so, so it was a while back. And um, I started trying to write more tunes out for the band, and you know, rock bands like to improvise and jazz, and that I realized was a problem. And I met a cellist who told me, you know, if you write for a string quartet, that's what we do, we read it. So I self-proclaimed myself a classical composer and just started composing. So I was about 16 when I just gravitated away from it, performing and into writing. I went to grad school away, and when I moved back here, um, st started a couple of companies that ultimately were writing music for what was down here, which were primarily commercials and documentaries. And then I would write my concert music, which I still have a career doing that on the side, some operas and symphonies and things like that that I love to do. And then um, in 19, the mid-90s, Lionsgate, uh, when the film credits started, film companies started coming here. They weren't doing music here, but there was one fella, Joel C. High at Lionsgate, who ran their music department, who was very interested in New Orleans music, and then became interested in could he score in New Orleans, not just license out of New Orleans. He and I hooked up, he sent me a script, I scored a couple of scenes, recorded it down here with the orchestra, he loved it. Um, then it, the hurricane hit and he basically started sending work just to employ people in, in, a very, in a very nice fashion. And ultimately I started writing for Lionsgate and getting more and more movie, music into films and ultimately it's a very small community out there. So he would talk, someone from Warner Brothers would call him, hey, do you know someone in New Orleans? They'd hook up with me and it just has grown uh, into uh, you know, a full-time sort of job, you know, doing what I want, always wanted to do with a full-time basis. Yeah. Well, currently the course um, is designed, um, you know, it's called film scoring. So there's this branch, the trunk of the tree is film scoring, but then it breaks into two sides. We break into people who aren't interested in writing music because that's not their thing, but are interested in the music supervision side. They're interested in, in um, the, the legal business side of pure, how do you license something? What's the paperwork look like? How do you, you, know, how do you help a director communicate with a composer? Because very often a music supervisor is a translator between the two. Uh, and then the other side of it is kids who want to actually write music and score a film. So what, what I do is I have half a dozen or a dozen scenes of big projects that have, um, I've been able to get my hands on that throughout the course of the semester we, uh, I share with the kids. And what I do is I take the, the ones that are in, the students that want to be supervisors and I assign each week a series of composers to them. The supervisors see the scene a week earlier and get their thoughts together and then they communicate to that group of composers I've assigned to them what they want to hear and then those guys write and then the next week we play it all in the classroom to the whole class. I let the class comment, first the supervisor who hired them so to speak and then the other people put in their two cents and then I give them more of a sometimes less of a creative view of it and, and much more of a technical view, how to make those strings sound better or maybe you should try this or that, kind of orchestrational ideas. So the class is a very interactive class. The only real paperwork I give people, because I think this is a really craft-oriented project, um, every week though I give everybody five to ten composers that they have to write little mini bios on that work in film because you know most kids in music school might know the jazz world or they might know the classical world but nobody really teaches you who's who and when you're out there or talking to a studio the references are always Thomas Newman kind of thing or this thing or they go back and say you know Alfred Newman well you need to know who these people are because that's the vocabulary and that's the the milieu like if you were trying to play in an orchestra and someone said Beethoven, if you didn't know who he was, you probably aren't going to get the gig, you know. So I, I try to give them that kind of historical perspective of the writers. Um, and then I bring in guest people. I bring in people who do what I do when they come to town. Some people in town that do it, I bring them in. 
I bring in lawyers to talk about the legal paperwork, and so I give them a composer contract and say, look, circle every word you don't understand, and then I bring someone in to ask your questions. So it's a very much a participa uh, participation is more important to me than your bios even. You know, it's really about you asking because the field is huge, and I don't, you know, I'll tell you whatever you want to know in a very practical, here's how it works level, not what you're going to study in a book, here's how it goes. Well, scoring is, um, I mean, the honest truth is it's probably 70% communication skills with people who generally don't know and are confidently telling you, look, I don't know your vocabulary, because you're, you're dealing with directors, and they don't know music, and some do, and some are beyond me in their knowledge, especially of film music, but for the most part you're dealing with people who are a bit intimidated. They've worked on a film two or three years, from scripting it, to funding it, to finally shooting it, and now they got a month to go and they're going to hand over to me a cut film and say, put music to it, which has a huge impact on the, the, content, the emotional content of the film. So a lot of it is talking. What I tend to like to do is when they send me a cut, um, write some just pieces of music that I think that inspired from what I saw, not, not with any particular, well, with a scene in mind, but not with a particular um, version of it that would be a good score piece, but a good piece of music. Shoot it to them for feedback and just see what they're responding to. And then once they've kind of got past that stage, I then take a scene that I thought it would fit in and then use that as a basis to then cut it and score it and move things around and make it work inside the scene. So that's, that's my, a process I love because it's interactive, it's collaborative, and that's part of the great joy of film music is you're working with other people. And then the final stage is when you get to bring in the real players because everything's done. Uh, it's all MIDI and computerized unless you're John Williams or Randy Newman, you know, but if you're us, I mean even Hans Zimmer, you, you do demos and, and that have to sound as if they could be final product. Demo concept is no longer this isn't a demo anymore, now it's like it has to sound perfect. And then you replace, with the, the budget, you replace the fake instruments or as many as you want or can with real players. So that's sort of the final two days before you then spend three or four days mixing it and sending it off. You mix it into what's called stems. You don't send them a stereo mix. Your demos you do, you send them a stereo demo. But when you get down to it, let's say you have a, a score, I'm working on one now that's kind of a lot of funk music. So I want to have drums, bass, guitar, piano, organ, and horn section. And I will probably mix it, um, each of those tracks will get mixed into a stereo drum stem, a stereo bass stem, a stereo guitar, organ, piano, and horns. And I'll have those stems, those tracks then get mixed down and put into a file. And then I'll mix the levels the way I think they work. And then I'll send all those separate files to them. They'll place it in. And they might decide, oh, the horns are too loud here. Or they might want to take something out. So they end up having some final editing they can do. But that's really the process. As you send, if you're doing an orchestra, you might send the strings as a stereo stem, the brass. If you have a solo violin part, that's a separate one. And you pan that one in the middle. There's all kinds of ways that you get into where you place it in the stereo image so they can control what they want to control. Well, I'm not in LA because, um, I mean, the, the easy answer is uh, A, when I finished school out there, that's where I went to school. When I came back, it was because I realized that I had not really absorbed as much from the, the ethnographic music down here as I w should have because I got so involved in classical composition. So I moved back thinking I was going to, and that's why I got into commercials, was I would hire Rebirth or hire a gospel choir and write for them and learn what they did. They became my next kind of post-postgraduate school, was working with musicians who did something totally different than I did. Um, and so I came back for that purpose, figuring I'd go back out there. But then once the industry started coming here, um, uh, uh, I've, I've sort of got that niche of the guy a lot of people call and so I jokingly say they pay me to stay here because they need someone like me here who can put together, who understands the paperwork, understands union rules, understands non-union situations, understands who can be good on camera, can get something recorded, can find a studio, find the mics, you know, all the things that have to happen in a town that isn't built around film industry. So uh, I always jokingly say they just pay me to stay here, so I do.
Absolutely. You know, um, I mean, I'll tell you, like my break with Warner Brothers went like this. Uh, they were, I was on set for a TV show where I'd put some, I just, I was really just working for the supervisor in LA, putting musicians in the scene to, to mime the music. And um, the VP, uh, Darryl, uh, Darren at Warner Brothers called a friend of mine who said, hey, who do you know in New Orleans was shooting this film, Green Lantern down there. So, and we have a band. Well, the band was Larry Seberth's band who, that was doing this show at uh, Harris on R&B, and they wanted one of those tracks to be at a big party. So they just wanted me to contract it. So I got on the phone with them, and I said, hey, let me call you back. I called Larry because we're friends and said, do you mind if I get in this? So my first relationship was to make sure Larry was cool that I was there. He said, man, I wish you would produce it. I'm so tired of all these questions because a lot of producing in that world is answering the you know, questions for people who don't know what you're doing. So uh, I ended up getting not only the contractor gig to just do the contract, but I got the producer job in the studio. My only deal was I want the director to come meet with me before we record. He can leave, but I really want to hear from him what he wants because ultimately he has to approve it. So he showed up in the morning and he mentioned, oh yeah, besides that song, I need one other song. And I said, well, they haven't cleared anything. And Warner Brothers can't clear something on a dime. I mean, they could, but that check would be a lot larger than it needs to be. So I said, well, I could write something. And so I wrote something with Larry. We recorded a quick demo. I shot it to Warner Brothers. They liked it. They said, yeah, record it. So I ended up on that project being the contractor, being the producer, and then getting a, a little piece of music in the film. And then there was 10 days of, of location work. So then I ended up getting on that contract. And these were all union contracts. So it just kind of blossomed. And then I, Darren got to know me and said, dude, you're my call in New Orleans. And, and it just, just led to six films with them now. And going from that to orchestrating for them, conducting for them, and trying, they keep trying, God bless them, to, they put me up for films. But you know, one will hit one day. The right, the right project will come and I'll have the headache of scoring for a studio. Cut that out. <laughs> I'll have the honor of scoring for a studio. I thought, uh, you know, one of the most talented fellows that came through my class early on, I think Joe was like, uh, Joe Shirley's his name. And Joe came in, I think it might have been my first or second year teaching the class, I don't remember. But Joe, um, much better looking than me, but he reminded me of me in terms of his demeanor. So that whole way that you make people feel comfortable, Joe has, and I told him this when I finished the story, I told him, I said, Joe, you're going to be with some kids at this program you're in, the USC graduate film program he got in, which is 20 kids, that's it. And the minority of them are from America. They're from all over the world. That program is so infamous now. And I said, Joe, but what you have that a lot of these kids aren't going to have is a way of making pe people feel comfortable. I said, you know, be intimidated by nothing because ultimately you're going to be sitting in rooms talking to people and that's what's going to get you the work. And you've got that and you can't teach that. You know, you can practice it, but if you're born with it, it's a blessing. And Joe's born with it. So he was, I know, in the classical program here as a composer and, and wrote some really fine stuff, but was really interested, has a band and does the, the, whole, the whole band thing. And finally, he, uh, I helped, I think, a lot of people pushed him to apply. He was a little worried about it. I said, dude, just go for it. He got in the program. He's, he's close to half finished now and having a time of his life, scoring, 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 recording. And I'm, I'm using him when he comes to town. I always use him, bring him in to, uh, to the session so he can just see it, how it goes down. And he's, he's helped me on several projects. So he was certainly getting into the USC graduate, it's a one-year master's program in film scoring, to me is the pinnacle of, of the educational opportunity. And I am thrilled because he has told me when he did his little, the round table, he promotes the program here because he knows the class we did together and the program here really changed his understanding about what was going on. So it's a, it was really, I always thought this would be a great feeder program for that program. But Seattle has one. I mean, there's some other great ones out there, but you're in LA, man. That's really, you can't do better than that. To be. I mean, the easy answer is, you know, move out to Los Angeles because ultimately, you know, the film business is still primarily, in the, especially the music side, because it's part of the post-production process. And the pre-production is sort of wherever the people live. 
productions wherever they're going to shoot it and they shoot a lot down here but once they finish shooting they all fly back generally to Los Angeles to be with their families and their friends and edit the film there so it's very convenient to use a composer in Los Angeles because they're around the corner but internet and all this has really made it feasible for them not to have to do that so the, the if you're going to stay here or be anywhere else the thing to do is is get to know every young director you can and do anything you can for them, paid or unpaid, because one out of 50 is going to get a shot. And I, I have endless stories of friends of mine who were big name LA composers who went to school with someone, scored their projects, and then all of a sudden they get a TV show. And they of course hire their buddy because they have a working relationship, a communication relationship. So the real key for composers is to get to know um, directors, uh, find peers who are just starting out and grow with them. And then your name gets bounced around. Once you're on the, once you're on the radar, you're on the radar, like a great studio guitar player, you know.